So this is a part of um, a welcome series. We've been doing a six-week series to introduce folks to the work of the Institute and also some of our allies and partners, in part because we've just moved into this space. So you're in a new office for IPS. Um, so this is part of our housewarming. Thank you for being part of our, of our housewarming. In true housewarming style, we started with a party. Um, but since then, we've been holding conversations with some of our friends and allies. Our first panel was with the National Domestic Workers Alliance to talk about labor standards and labor rights. Um, we had an arts and politics panel where we brought our um, local, one of our resident, resident um, playwrights uh, named John Pfeffer, who was here with Split This Rock, a poetry um, group that looks at witness and poems of witness and provocation. Um, we had the Triple D panel, which was about diplomacy, demilitarization, and drug policy. Um, and then last week we had a conversation about inequality and the elections. And so this week we're talking about um, climate change and inequality and thinking about how the work that we do at the national, local, if we have, a, I think we may have a guest that may speak a little about international level, um, the work on climate change and inequality can actually be um, looked at at intersections so that we're thinking transformatively about um, social change, that both of those problems that are, are often worked on separately can actually be combined, uh, in, in my opinion, to be worked on more effectively if we look at if we look at those intersections. So just to say, I guess a couple housewarming, house, housekeeping things. Um, if you would put your phone on silent, that would be much appreciated. Um, there are bathrooms uh, along this wall, so feel free to sneak out if you need to at any time. Um, we'll go until about 12:45, but one of our guests, Jennifer Bryan, is going to sneak out at 1:30. So she wanted me to let you know that she's not running um, running out on you on, on purpose, but she has another commitment. So we thank her for being here while she can be here. Um, and yeah, just to say that kind of the spirit of this conversation is certainly not that I think, I'll speak for myself, I'm not claiming that IPS has the answers on kind of what's the transformational way forward on all on these two big questions. But I think in the spirit of, um, of IPS and the work that many of us do, we're really interested in exploring those intersections and experimenting at those intersections. And know that many of you in the room are uh, doing that in your professional life, in your activist life. So we really welcome the, um, the interaction with you all. We're going to do a couple of presentations from up front, and then we welcome comments and questions and would like to engage more in a conversation at that point um, as well. So I'm going to kick it off and try my best to be brief, and then I will introduce Jennifer Bryant um, from Cooperative DC and Jordan Esteval from People's Action when um, it's their turn to, to talk. Um, I feel really sure to you guys. I'm not going to introduce her. Um, so uh, why talk about climate change and inequality right now? Um, I'll, I'll take the, the climate or weird weather, which you know we've had all of May. It's, this is like the first time we've seen sun yet so far. Um, globally, this is a really important moment in the in the realm of climate change. What we've joined 194 countries in signing something called the Paris Accord, which is um, negotiated to keep global warming to safe levels. Uh, it doesn't, unfortunately. The, the the things that are negotiated will not keep warming where it needs to be, and in fact, we're on track to about double the warming by the end of the century. That um, science has told us will keep us safe. Um, and we're already seeing the impacts of climate change in our own country and abroad sooner than scientists had originally predicted at, at levels of pollution lower than we had thought originally and more intensely than they had thought originally. So, you know, 2015 is the warmest year on record. 2014 was the warmest year on record in 2014. Um, we just had a heat record in India yesterday. So we're seeing the impacts of climate change really happening in our lives. Um, so it's part, of, it's part of the conversation, all the apocalyptic films. I think we're seeing it in a lot of the popular culture. And here in the US, this kind of post-Paris moment is playing out, and I think, in two really interesting ways. In the political realm, we've got Bernie Sanders, who has said that climate change is the, is the biggest threat facing American security. You've got Hillary Clinton saying, we're going to close down the mines, and those coal workers are going to have to find other work. And then you've got Trump saying, um, she's crazy, climate change is the Chinese hoax, and we're going to pull out of the the Paris Convention. Um, so there's a real spectrum on, on, the political, on the political range there. And we've also got movements in the United States who've said, we're going to continue to put our bodies in front of the fossil fuel uh, economy. Um, people, this past weekend, were doing actions all over the country and all over the world. Um, one was blocking trains with, with um, carrying oil. 
uh, and kept trains for three days um, from moving, uh, delivering that oil. Um, Two-thirds of the newly installed energy last year was solar instead of fossil fuels. So we are seeing kind of shift in public opinion. We're seeing shifts in the market around energy. Um, we're seeing a real recognition, I think, for the understanding that we need to transition to clean energy. Um, but there's trepidation and there's concern about jobs and who this transition would ultimately be for at the end of the day. So then on the other hand, on the inequality side, um, you know, we're seeing, a, again, a lot more a sustained conversation on extreme inequality. Um, people are kind of on the wealth income inequality side. I feel like it's, it's kind of personified by the Bernie Sanders campaign. Young people, millennials, young people of color, kind of white progressives are thinking about wealth and income inequality and talking about that a lot in this campaign. And the racial inequality side, racial inequity, uh, I think the movement, movement for black lives and the decentralized groups that are growing up around that movement are really an important formation that's bringing racial inequality to the front of the national conversation. I think generally people are noticing the pie is getting bigger. You know, we're, we're kind of over our the economic recession. Um, but people are also noticing that those slices of the 90 for the 99 percent are staying the same size or even getting smaller. Um, people are seeing, um, you know, we're winning some campaigns. We've got the fight for 15. We've won $15 minimum wage in some places, but it's not. Uh, it's not comprehensive, it's not universal, and families are still being squeezed, they're trying to do more with less, parents are working multiple jobs, people are struggling, struggling to make house and car payments. Um, and then along comes Katrina, and people are displaced from their homes and from their neighborhoods, if you live in the Ninth Ward, um, or Hurricane Sandy comes along and the lights go out for nine weeks if you live in the far Rockaways in, um, in New York. Um, or if you're one of the African-American families who is, uh, was rejected for rebuilding support at twice the rate of white families in New Jersey, or if you can't afford insurance and then you can't um, afford to rebuild, then you're right at the intersection of climate change and inequality. Um, and that's super important <laughs> because that's a place where people are, um, are really feeling crises intersect and I think are looking for solutions to both crises at the same time. So it's not just people at one end of the spectrum, at the, at the, at the end of the spectrum where people are struggling to get, get by. It's also people at the ultra-wealthy end of the spectrum where that intersection exists. So there's a recent study um, built off of some of the work um, that's been happening globally around extreme inequality. And this study looked at the carbon emissions of people in the United States, one of the most unequal societies in terms <coughs> of wealth and income. And they saw that the lowest 10%, the, low, the lowest income decile, has an average carbon footprint per person of 31 tons of carbon dioxide a year, which is pretty high in the global average. Um, but the highest 10, oh, that 3.1, sorry. The highest 10% has a carbon footprint of 32 tons of carbon dioxide per year. But the top 1% has a, goal, a footprint of 316 tons of carbon dioxide. So what that shows us is the ultra wealthy um, are not just concentrating kind of power and wealth in their hands, but they're also um, emitting a, a lot of pollution, a ton of pollution, a lot more than a ton, 300 times a ton of pollution. <laughs> and, so, um, and so that tells us something about, I think, the movements that were, the efforts that we're doing collectively. Of course, it means we have to be lifting up um, folks who've been marginalized for a long time, historically and today, and that's a bunch of, of movement work that needs to be done. But we also have to be powering down the wealthy. That's a key part that I think gets a little bit less played. So at IPS, we've been kind of thinking about it as three tiers, uh, three kind of uh, uh, legs on a stool. So one is about powering down the wealthy, powering down elites. That includes companies and their lobbyists and those folks as well. With more participation in decision making of, uh, that affects people's lives, um, whether it's owning the means of production, um, which Jennifer will talk a bit more, but generally democracy is one leg of that stool. Another leg is around building broad-based wealth that stays in communities, kind of an equitable, an equitable system. Um, and then the other leg is about having an economy that's in line with ecological limits, recognizing that actually we can't just keep growing our way out of this problem of inequality because the pie can't get a whole lot bigger. That's what climate change is telling us. We can't, we can't just keep expanding. Um, we call that just transition. It's not, obviously not a, a term we made up ourselves. The labor movement um, made that up many, many decades ago. Um, it's being used by people around the world now to talk about shifting from a fossil fuel dirty energy economy to a clean energy, 
clean energy economy with democracy um, and, and equity. And we're contributing to that in, I think, a number of ways through looking at wealth taxes and luxury taxes, um, thinking about how to take the power away from corporations um, like power companies, um, and also thinking about how to spend public finance. Um, in a responsible way that moves it out of the fossil fuel sector. But, um, but the kind of the question I think that we, that I wanted to lay on the table and get some ideas from our guests today is around, so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we fight inequality? How do we grow the, you know, how do we, how do we make this transition happen in a way that um, is more meaningful than the green job shift, which ended up kind of being a little bit hollow? Um, but also, how do we do it without necessarily growing the pie so much that we then bump up against ecological limits? How do we how do we get to the intersection of climate change um, and inequality? And so, you know, at IPS, we think that that work will be led by social movements. Ah, oh, we have a, a guess that hopefully is coming. We'll see. Um, social movements that build power, um, build power to exercise that that kind of movement muscle in <coughs> all different places, in local, state, but also in federal spaces. Um, but also make material differences in the lives where people are organizing themselves. So I think no two better people to be here to talk about that. Um, I'm going to first introduce Jordan Estevao, who I mentioned was part of, is a, a senior strategist at um, Client People's Action. People's Action is a new formation. Um, you, you may know their um, well-established um, economic justice and pro-democracy movement building groups, National People's Action. Uh, U.S. Action and Alliance for Just Society. I think I've got those right, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and so in this formation, Jordan is supporting um, climate, directing climate justice work and supporting um, more than 60 local and state affiliates uh, who are base building groups who together make up over a million people across the country um, in their work and helping provide some movement infrastructure so that their work collectively makes, kind of makes an impact that's more than some of its parts. Um, so Jordan also speaks truth to power through the bass guitar in a local um, hip-hop funk band called Shining Blade Theory. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Jordan. Thanks, Janet. You're welcome. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jordan. Uh, I'm with People's Action. Uh, and as Janet mentioned, we are a racial and economic justice organization. Um, the legacy organization that I come from, National People's Action, has been around uh, for about 40 years. Uh, uh, and collectively, we're... Uh, we're, we're about 60 organizations in 30 states, several hundred organizers on the ground, um, uh, and our base, our, uh, the rank and file membership of our organization is about a third, a third, a third black, white, and Latino, just to give you a sense of, a sense of the organization. Um, and so we actually have entered into working on climate justice directly in the past couple of years. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is because we really do see it, you know, we're a racial and economic justice organization, and we see climate justice as, um, you know, one of the greatest <coughs> racial and economic justice uh, uh, issues of our time. Uh, I'll go into that um, uh, a little bit. So um, I've been an organizer for about 20 years, uh, started on uh, in, in, in Chicago working on local infrastructure issues and, uh, and and immigration issues, uh, and I've done a bunch of stuff since then. Um, and I came on to National People's Action, running our banks and financial industry, uh, our banks and financial industry work, particularly um, uh, responding to the fact that the financial crisis in 2007, 8, 9, 10 um, was really impacting people in our communities uh, disproportionately. Right. So um, I'd like to. Uh, ask for a show of hands. How many of you all are uh, are farmers or miners, or uh, or live off the land in some way? Doesn't count. <laughs> uh, like like do you, you know, make your living. You like actually live from it. How about your parents? How many of your parents? You got one hand. No. How many grandparents? Ah, a bunch more hands. It's like ten hands. How about great grandparents? Lived off the land in some way. Yeah. So that's like most of the people in most of the people in the room now. So, you know, that's just emblem you know, it's emblematic, something that we don't, you know, think about uh, a lot. But you know, uh, these grand uh, 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 economic shifts that like change the way that work happens, change the way that uh, that wealth is distributed. Um, so my 
grandparents um, lived, I should have raised my own hand, uh, uh, lived, lived off the land in Tennessee uh, on my mother's side and uh, moved north to Chicago with the, you know, along with the great migration that happened of African Americans to, uh, to, to the north in the 20s through the 60s. Um, and you know, they moved there for economic opportunity and they found economic opportunity, uh, but they found that they didn't get as much economic opportunity as other people maybe got. All right? um, and you know, so take for example, um, uh, you know, people, National People's Action was founded in the fight against redlining. Anyone know what that means? Mm -hmm. Redlining is the practice where in the in the in the sixties and seventies, um, banks used to literally draw a red line around the black neighborhood, the Latino neighborhood, you know, maybe like a dotted red line around the Italian neighborhood, and say we're not going to make we're not going to make loans in this in these in these communities. We're not going to let people buy houses in these communities. Right? They're going to rent. Um, and the fact of the matter is, my grandparents never did end up buying property in Chicago. They raised, you know, raised, raised a family there, had careers there. They ended up retiring back to Tennessee where they could buy a house. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just an example of how these great economic shifts, they tend to drive inequality, all right? And our history is just like riddled with examples like that. Uh, you know, well-documented example of, um, uh, uh, of the New Deal that, uh, that, that excluded, you know, large parts of the African-American community. Um, uh, you know, but you can look more recently, you know, both to like positive and negative economic shifts, right? So the housing crisis, uh, as I started to mention, you know, everyone got screwed, but black people, Latinos got screwed extra, right? Um, if you look at, uh, so some, some of the growth areas, like the, like the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, what can I think of the word? Computers and stuff, you know, right? the 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 dot com uh, 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 boom. Like, you know, one of the results of that is that you can go to San Francisco and there's hardly any black mm -hmm. people left in San Francisco, right? It's because everyone didn't benefit equally from this economic this economic shift. So, um, um, uh, so climate um, uh, change is driving a lot of economic changes, right? Uh, we see that the coal industry is on the decline. Uh, Peabody Energy just a few uh, a few a few <coughs> weeks ago filed for bankruptcy. Um, uh, the uh, but something like twenty you know uh, twenty six coal companies have gone out of business over the last uh, over the last ten years. You know, so posi you know positive thing overall, uh, but the economic shift that it represents is not so positive for everyone. Meanwhile, um, uh, solar industry, for example. Job growth is 20 times what it is in the rest of the economy in the, in the in the solar sector, right? So that's all well and good, but there's a lot of questions that we need to ask about what kind of jobs are they, how do they pay, and who is getting them? Uh, and also the product of you know solar energy is it affordable in our communities? Um, is it accessible? Um, so uh, as this shift is happening, and we think that you know we're we're, we're it's it is it, it, it has begun and is going to continue to to, to happen. Uh, we're really interested in making sure that um, that our people benefit um, uh, as much as the uh, 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 from, from 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 the economic changes that are happening. And this is like, by the way, like this is like sidebar, but like you know, com corporations think about it in this way too. They think differ differentially, right? So like, if uh, you're a, you have you have a cell phone company and the cell phone market expands by five percent and you only grow by three percent, then you're not doing well. Um, if the cell phone market contracts by five percent, and you only contract by three percent, then you're then you're doing great, right? And that is uh, so. We're we're wanting to make sure that we are um, uh, that we are expanding ahead of the curve and contracting below the curve. Anyway, um, so um, one of the areas uh, that we see as a point of intervention is in um, uh, the EPA's Clean Power Plan. Folks familiar with that? So this is, uh, you know, the centerpiece of Obama's uh, climate change change policy requires <coughs> every state uh, to reduce its uh, its carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants, especially um, uh, by a percentage that's set by that's set by the federal government. Um, it's not a, it's not a perfect uh, policy for lots of reasons, um, but um, it's it's what we got, and we and we think there's opportunity in it. Um, so 
uh, it requires states to reduce their carbon emissions, but it doesn't say a lot about how they need to do that, right? So there's a series of choices that are kind of implicit in the way that the clean power plan is structured. Um, so one of them that is, you know, it's kind of implicit is like if, if a state is actually going to comply with it, right? Which like lots of states are already saying that they're not, they're just not going to do it. Um, um, uh, so you know, so that's one set of, uh, that, that, that's one question. The second one is how are they going to reduce their carbon emissions? So are they going to do it by um, leaning more on natural gas and fracking and uh, uh, and incineration and nuclear energy and other false solutions like that, or are they going to do it by um, by shifting uh, toward more reliance on renewable energy and by uh, reducing demand by by increasing energy efficiency? Um, second set of you know set of choices. The third set, the, and then the third set of choices is what I is what I is what I started to outline, which is you know who is going to benefit and you know which communities are we going to focus on? Are we going to take a blanket approach? Which uh, we, you know, which we've learned historically over and over again, that blanket, colorblind uh, mm -hmm. approaches uh, do not actually end up helping the people that need the help the most. Um, uh, uh, and uh, um, so, for example, if a state is going to invest more in energy efficiency, does that mean that they're going to subsidize a corporation to like build like green skyscrapers, or are they going to actually help low-income communities with like older housing stock? Insulate their homes, install weather, uh, install install solar panels, install um, uh, double pane windows, and so on. Um, and then again, the question of like, uh, uh, how how is that how is that going to work in terms of hiring, in terms of business practices? Um, is there are there going to be strings attached to the companies that are doing these that are that are delivering on these contracts of employ of, uh, of job quality standards uh, or not? So, in Illinois, for example. Uh, we uh, uh, we've, ha we've had a bill moving uh, uh, now called the, the the Clean Jobs Bill, um, which is you know a vehicle to for Illinois to comply with the EPA's Clean Power Plan. Right? And uh, we've recently, uh, just in the past couple of weeks, kind of uh, uh, worked with a, a set of allies and a set of uh, of, of our affiliates there uh, to amend that bill to include uh, one. Uh, a requirement that 50% um, uh, of the jobs are going to be focused on low-income and people of color communities. Um, that uh, that things like opt-in tariffs and ways that uh, to finance uh, uh, energy efficiency retrofits and solar panels and so on. That there's a way to do that without going into debt. Um, uh, so that you know, uh, regardless of your income, credit rating, wealth, you can still buy into this new energy economy. Um, um, and and also making sure that uh, that uh, uh, that the the bill includes an analysis of how it's going to uh, of how it may or may not disparately impact different communities. So um, I think I'll uh, I'll stop there um, and uh, and we'll hear more about DC. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll yeah we'll come back with more questions and cool. we want to learn more. Um. Thank you very much, Jordan. So I'm excited to introduce Jennifer Bryant, who is an organizer um, and emer emerging cooperative developer with Cooperation DC. Um, Cooperation DC is a product of One DC, which probably many of you um, know. It's a long-time <coughs> grassroots community organizing um, group here in Washington DC. Um, Cooperation DC's mission is to expand opportunities for dignified employment and democratic ownership in low-income communities of color throughout uh, through the development of worker-owned cooperatives. And their vision is a city uh, and, and world where all workers reap the benefits of their own labor, have a meaningful voice in their workplace, and apply those democratic practices in other areas of their lives. Um, so I'm really excited to have Jennifer here to share with us. And just also say that Jennifer co-hosts and produces a program called Voices with Vision, which you can hear weekly um, on DC's own local uh, community radio station, WPFW, with our um, their very, I guess, very own Netfa Freeman. Um, so we're really excited to have you um, come share more, kind of how this connection happens here in Washington, D.C. Thank you, uh, Janet. So hello, everybody. Hello. Um, my name is Jennifer Bryant. Um, I wanted to start by just saying um, how I situate myself in this city. I live in southeast D.C. in a neighborhood called Congress Heights. Um, Congress Heights is east of the Anacostia River. Um, which I think is significant because the Anacostia River is both a physical line of demarcation, but it's also a socioeconomic line of demarcation in the city. It's a line that marks the haves from the have-nots in the city. 
um, and I think that's significant. One thing I want to lift up about the Anacostia River is that back in the day, um, black churches in Southeast would go down to the river to baptize people mm -hmm. in their congregation. It was a place where people would have cookouts and go fishing. And now you can't use the river because of all the dumping there. I mean, mm -hmm. people still fish there. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to eat the fish, but people still do. But I think that um, in terms of environmental degradation, it's something that black and Latino communities in the city are familiar with. Um, we may not discuss it in the same terms, but it's something that people are talking about and it's something that people are organizing around. Um, in my neighborhood, I know that there are people that organize um, kind of urban foraging walks where you can learn what plants are edible in your community. And these are people that live in the community that are organizing this. Um, people are doing urban gardening and talking about um, uh, how we can alleviate food deserts from the, from the grassroots. So all of this organizing, I, what I've found um, over the last few years is that there's a huge disconnect between how environmental justice and climate justice is being messaged nationally um, and how it connects to people on the ground. Um, and so when I was organizing, I organized for a year and a half with 1DC. I was a Black Worker Center organizer. Um, we started a Black Worker Center in Southeast DC um, to address some of the disparities that exist uh, in terms of labor in the city. Um, in Southeast DC, there's double digit unemployment and it's, it's racialized, the employment numbers are racialized because of the history of um, inequality in, in the city. But when I was an organizer uh, with 1DC, every other month or so I get an uh, email from an environmental justice group saying, hey, you know, we want to partner with you, come join this action, or come to this planning meeting for this action. And um, we never really could engage because we were in, involved in kind of crisis level fights on the community level around housing and jobs, which are the most pressing needs in people's lives. So, you know, we're getting these emails about carbon or something, but people are being displaced from the city at an astronomical rate. I mean, over 40,000 black people displaced from DC over the last decade. Um, so we were organizing around uh, uh, buildings like Mount Vernon Plaza, where residents received a notice saying that their rent in two months would be going up by $600 a month. Um, and you know, DC, while nationally the homeless rates are decreasing, DC's homeless rate is increasing. Mm -hmm. Um, as we see all of this development that's not serving people whose families have been here for generations. So getting these climate justice emails, we just weren't sure how to engage. Um, in September, I was invited to speak at the Moral Action on Climate Rally when the Pope came to the city. And it really gave me an opportunity to sit down and think about, okay, what are the real connections here? Um, I think that what we're thinking about on the ground in a city that is experiencing wide-scale gentrification is that our communities are not for sale. And I think what the climate justice movement is messaging is that the planet is not for sale. That, you know, these things belong to all of us um, as people um, and as animals on this planet. We share this planet. We share community. Um, and I think that there are so many intersections between the climate justice movement and the movement around housing and jobs and food in this city, but we haven't really found the ways to articulate those intersections um, in ways that are meaningful to people on the ground. Mm -hmm. But there is one uh, organizing campaign locally that I want to lift up because I think that they're doing an excellent job of messaging those intersections. And that's an organizing campaign being led by a group called Empower DC. Um, and they're organizing in Buzzard Point, which is in Southwest DC. And it's the site of the new DC United uh, soccer stadium that's slated to uh, be opened in 2018 um, at a cost of $300 million, 150 million, which is coming from the city and 150 million, which is coming from DC United. Buzzard Point is, right on the southwest waterfront. It's right by Nationals Ballpark, uh, the uh, baseball stadium. Uh, it's been a long time industrial site. Um, there's a Pepco power plant there. There are all these concrete yards there. And it's bordered by three public housing communities, uh, Greenleaf, James Creek, and Syfax. 
Um, and it's a place where uh, the DC Department of Environment, when they were doing their uh, environmental mitigation study of the site for the soccer stadium, they found metals, they found petroleum compounds and volatile organic compounds in both the soil and the groundwater. Um, so when they begin to excavate for the stadium, they're trying to figure out how they can mitigate all of these things being further released into the air and into the groundwater and impacting the residential communities that are right around the site. So Empower DC has been organizing residents to see how they can, one, push back. Uh, the original fight was that we don't want the soccer stadium mm -hmm. at all. And I think that one of the reasons why the soccer stadium is happening was because the community was saying we don't want the soccer stadium, but labor unions and developers who own the politicians in the mm -hmm. city were all saying, you know, we do want the stadium, development over everything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the unions were saying they wanted the soccer stadium because it would, it would create a tremendous amount of jobs mm -hmm. um, on the trade union side. So the soccer stadium is happening. And so now the community is saying, one, how can we mitigate the environmental impact of this soccer stadium? Two, how can we connect that environmental impact to the residential communities, public housing communities that are directly around it, make sure that these people um, in these public housing communities are not displaced? Mm -hmm. And then three, how can we make sure that people in the immediate surrounding communities are benefiting from the jobs that will be created mm -hmm. um, from this DC United Stadium? So I think Buzzard Point is an example of how folks on the ground are connecting environment, jobs, and housing. And I think that unless we do that, we're not really going to be able to mobilize people um, around climate justice on the local level. So um, going back to the unions, I think that's significant. My primary interest is labor in the new economy. And I think when you look around the country at different climate justice fights, you'll often find unions standing on the wrong side of that. And that's because unions represent workers, um, and workers are trying to work. I mean, the economy is terrible, um, and mining is bad, but miners need mining because that's how they feed their families. And so I think that it creates a tremendous opportunity for us that are involved in the new labor movement, for those of us who are interested in the new economy, and, um, and finding new ways to show people that there are jobs on the other side of this too, that jobs don't have to be connected to the old way. Um, and you mentioned solar, which is something that we're really looking at in DC, but specifically around um, creating solar co-ops so that people can learn how to do solar installations but control that labor um, themselves and be in charge of um, making decisions around their own work. I think what's interested, uh, interesting about cooperatives, which is Cooperation DC is mainly focused on, is that unlike traditional businesses, worker-owned cooperatives are centered on a triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. so it's not just about um, creating businesses that are profitable, but it's about creating um, businesses that are socially sustainable, so that care about people, and creating businesses that are environmentally sustainable. So businesses that um, are not creating harm in terms of environment. And so I think that that's uh, one of the main entry points for connecting communities on the ground to the uh, climate justice movement is thinking about how we can emphasize this idea of the triple bottom line. Oh, sorry, gosh. There's always one person, but today it's me. <laughs> Bottom line around the cooperative movement, I think, is where we can create an inter intervention and connect the grassroots communities um, to the climate justice movement in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can you all welcome me giving a uh, name to me? Okay. Okay. Um, so I'd like to open it up. I know Jennifer has have to leave in about 20 minutes, um, so and we'll wrap up in about 40 uh, minutes. But I'd like to just open it up for a comment or question. I'm going to take three at a time. If there are a bunch of hands, if not, then we'll go. So sort of that, yeah, Dennis. I just wanted to switch Jennifer's program. Jennifer's working on the and um, so I've been working live in Cincinnati on the Harvard Rescue Co-op Farm and Food for about five years now, and it's based on a new model of the 
worker-owned, uh, a lot of the Mondragon, uh, mm -hmm. company out of Basque Country in Spain, and it's based on a 2009 agreement between Mondragon and the Steelworkers that merges the marketing model of the U.S. Union with the worker ownership model. So I was wondering if you'd heard about that, and if you, in your co-op worker co-op work, if you've heard about it, and whether you're looking at the incorporation of the union contract. That's a great question. And, um, you know, just to clarify, because unions are on the wrong side, which they are, but um, there are also a lot of times when unions are on the right side. And I think with the cooperative movement, we see that a lot. I actually got uh, the opportunity to be on a panel at Georgetown with Michael Peck, who is the U.S. Uh, representative from Mondragon. And uh, we were talking about union led worker co ops. And I think with the steel workers um, and and others, there are lots of examples where unions are kind of um, understanding the changes in the in the labor movement and kind of pushing and are at the forefront of shifting towards cooperative models, and that's very exciting. So, one to look with um, uh, the Black Workers Center, which I mentioned, we have a strong partnership with UFCW Local 400, um, and and we're looking at ways unions can be supportive of the development of worker-owned alternatives at the grassroots level. So that's also very exciting. And then in terms of the food piece that you mentioned, I also just wanted to raise that um, I'm coordinating along with the DC Department of Health and the DC Food Justice Action Team on August 6th of this year, Food Justice Conference, where we're gonna be looking at um, worker-owned and community-led alternatives um, to alleviate food deserts specifically in Ward 7 and Ward 8, where we had two Walmart stores pull mm -hmm. out that were supposed to kind of mitigate some of the food deserts that were there. And we didn't really want the Walmart anyway, but we see this as an opportunity to push for a community-led solution. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be August 6th. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if you want to make any comments, Jordan, on kind of the question. I think there's a question kind of underneath that question that I know was, we've been in rooms, Dennis, where people are asking kind of what's the you know, how do we how to kind of square the reality that there are unions who've been on, you know, who've been resistant to change because it makes sense. That's where their membership is. And some of the nudie uh, installations in public housing or its solar panel um, install installment on, on people's homes are um, tend not to be unionized, um, but there's not a reason why they necessarily shouldn't be unionized. Um, are you seeing anything in the national level that you're involved in where you're you're hit, you're seeing that intersection, or you're you're kind of grappling with that, or local groups are grappling with yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, so the, the you know, uh, there there there's 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 a tendency amongst kind of environmentalists to um, uh, to kind of dismiss the the, the perspective of, of of labor, which you're not doing, uh, but lots of us do, right? Um, and and I and I and I think the 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 reverse is true also, and I think it's really like. You know, both uh, both kind of parties. Like at, at the end of the day, like the people that we represent and whom we serve, like they both need to work and they also need to like breathe and drink water and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but but you know, so, so so I feel like for 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 our part, we haven't done, and by our I mean like environmentalists or or whatever, like we haven't done enough to really answer the question of, you know, like where. Where 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 do these jobs go and who gets them and and we're and we're, we're you know we're working to try to tackle that labor uh, with labor at the table but you know labor doesn't always want to be at the table um, there's I think a lot of history and a lot of baggage which you know uh, that, that where where folks on both sides kind of like react when to the other other uh, to to the other party that we're that we're grappling with in uh, in some states more than others. Um, and yeah, there's you know, I think it's a really vocal. Act I mean, I think it's a vocal minority of labor folks who are you know who are really directly impacted, who are having kind of an outsized impact on the overall labor movement. Mm -hmm. I hope the environment. I mean, I, I get the sense the environment community is has picked up the message increasingly. They're not there haven't, yet, but haven't figured out how, <laughs> haven't figured out how to, do, to it. do about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna grab a question here. Yeah, hi. Um, I work for an organization called the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, and um, we're looking at a campaign for EP itself that would 
price carbon, but benefit equal, everybody equally um, in the revenues. And I know that some folks are going to want the equal benefit for all residents in mm -hmm. these, um, these disparities. So, both on the matter of, to your point, like how do you talk about carbon and these like abstract policies that, that then land, and um, maybe any lessons learned on how to engage everybody in from the grassroots level to these concepts that tend to be a little abstract. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. I think one, just looking at um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. in the communities in which I'm working and in which I live, people are trying to meet their basic needs. So people are trying to meet housing, food, shelter, you know, housing, food, jobs, and mm -hmm. other basic needs. And so when people start coming and talking about carbon in 50 years from now, people are trying to think immediately, how am I going to pay my rent next week? How am I going to put food on my kid's table you know, tomorrow? So I think folks need to figure out how can we make these issues immediate? How can we put them in layman's terms? Because all of these things do affect us. Um, but I think, and I'm not sure how to articulate it in a way that makes sense. As I mentioned, I think if you can connect it to jobs, if you can connect it um, to the issues that people are dealing with every day, then it would make more sense. Mm -hmm. Another thing to the second part of your question is I think that when people come to engage communities, they tend to engage nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Nonprofits mm -hmm. aren't community. Nonprofits are nonprofits. Um, and so I think you have to find ways to um, actually interact with actual people. Um, so. Which the environmental doesn't have a lot of Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a question that we actively struggle with a lot, but like the, the best example I've seen of an organization that really works with grassroots mm -hmm. people in the community is um, uh, and that, that get it at a high level uh, around how their energy system works and like how they, you know, how they're impacted by it um, is, uh, is in Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. Buffalo has the highest black unemployment rate in the country. It's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, massive problems like lead pollution and, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's uh, and 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 like something like two thirds of the city has like moved out over the past uh, uh, over the past couple of decades. So, um, what Push Buffalo, our, our 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 affiliate organization, there is doing is they are they've been like leveraging uh, a number of state programs to actually tackle the, the um, uh, issues around housing and sustainability head on. Uh, head on. Um, so there's a, a section of Buffalo um, uh, where they are uh, building uh, sustainable housing, so you know, net zero housing. They are making it affordable so people from the community can move into it. They're training people from the community to build the housing and to do the weatherization, the maintenance, and the landscaping, and the solar panel installation. Uh, um, they're, uh, they're allying with other groups that do reentry for formerly incarcerated people uh, to learn how to do that work as well. Um, and it's like, you know, it's one section of the city where like every every block there's like two or three, how, you know, push Buffalo mm -hmm. housing uh, houses and like, you know, push Buffalo members working on the house. Um, the point there is that like even though it's, it's still relatively small, people in that community, like they will board buses to drive halfway across the, the state to go like, you know, to lobby and advocate on some energy, some obscure energy policy issue. Mm -hmm because there's something in their neighborhood yeah. that is real and tangible that they connect to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's something real that like if you, you know, even if they don't work for it, like they know someone who mm -hmm. works for it, their cousin or their friend works, you know, mm -hmm. uh, works uh, works for them or, uh, or lives in one of the houses. And if you threaten it, they get mad. And if you <laughs> say we can expand this and make it and make it bigger and better, they get excited. Uh, so I think like, you know, this is another thing that we're, uh, that, that, that we've been too slow to do is to uh, is to do things like what Jennifer is saying about like building cooperatives mm -hmm. to train people to do this work mm -hmm. to make these things real in the community so that you can mm -hmm. actually point to examples because right now in a lot of places you go and you say hey we're gonna you know we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, 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 lobby the state to invest in solar energy and it's going to create jobs and they're like you know it's like a myth it's mythology, <laughs> mythology. Mm -hmm. um, until we actually make it real. I think this is a piece, I mean, with a carbon tax in this area in particular, I mean, I, know, I think, I don't know if Jennifer's been involved, but I know um, Jordan's been involved with a group called the Climate Justice Alliance at the national level. Organization of, kind of, alliance, obviously, a network of, of 
mostly frontline groups. Um, and a carbon tax is kind of the conversation on carbon taxes landed in their lap the past couple years. And it's been, you know, a really fraught conversation because in some ways, obviously, pricing carbon um, could be a way to lower greenhouse gas emissions by changing behavior, but it's regressive by nature. Um, so I think, you know, this idea of, of figuring out who in the community needs to be part of the design structure of that, mm -hmm. uh, and so that the funding that's recouped from that actually goes back into communities that are hardest hit by, the, by climate change and by the tax and by the solutions to climate change, which I feel like is the three-part chunk of climate justice, in my mind, um, that those two second chunks often, I think, get ignored. Um, and so, yeah, I'd be happy to share with you the Climate Justice Alliance's kind of two-pager on if you're going to do a carbon tax, it has to do some of this good stuff and definitely not do some of this bad stuff. That would be maybe useful. So, thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you for going from the global to the local and back again. Uh, it's what you've been discussing is pretty much neglected by mainstream, uh, you know, cutting edge climate groups like 350.org. Although I'm not uh, criticizing the activists, but this is largely left out of discourse. I went to the left forum in New York City this past weekend, and one of the uh, one of the trade union uh, organizations that uh, I'd like to share is trade unions for energy democracy. It really has a lot of great resources and perspective on this. Uh, and just briefly, I, in terms of the local issue, the local perspective, uh, many of us were involved in Sustainable DC. They set a goal of 50% of renewable by 2030. We think that's too modest. And the problem really is what you put out, Jennifer. There's a big disconnect between those goals and economic development in DC. So people, and there are many intersections, as you pointed out, like the building a shelter in Ward 5 right next to a bus barn, and of course the air pollution issue in DC and the emissions from transportation. Um, so I, but I just want to say a little bit about the global issue that Janet brought up. Um, the issue of ecological limits, okay, um, and the issue of air pollution globally and uh, the health impacts of that. This is, a, this is an area, again, that uh, needs to be uh, really emphasized in organizing because several million, more than several million people die every year from air pollution from burning fossil fuels and lack of clean energy. I mean, it's something between three and seven million are estimated every year. And so this has to be disproportionate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and most of the people in the world suffer from energy poverty. They don't have enough energy to live a, you know, state of the science. Life expectancy, you can just look at a graph that relates to two. And that includes not only in the global south, but in the global north. I mean, if you're living in a slumlord uh, apartment house, you often don't have heat, you don't have air conditions. This is really this issue of the energy poverty has to be addressed. And finally, the issue of ecological limits, I think it ha should be looked at as being contingent to, first of all, what is the energy source that's being used? Because wind and solar could potentially really uh, expand those limits, that is, without negative effects on the environment, uh, if it's socially managed. And secondly, uh, agriculture, again, shifting from what we have now to permaculture, agroecologies, you know, local farming, that also can really shift, address this issue of the carrying capacity, because nitrate fertilizers are a big impact on the system. <laughs> That's a lot. Is there in that big packet of okay. is this anything that you all like to talk about? Well, I just wanted to lift up, um, I'm very critical of D.C. government, mm -hmm. but one thing that they are doing that's interesting is the D.C. Department of Energy and the Environment mm -hmm. is um, installing solar panels mm -hmm. on all of the public schools in the city, mm -hmm. um, and they've done several in Southeast already. Mm -hmm. um, I think with one of the projects that they're doing um, in Ward 8 right now, where they are going to be doing, they're piloting a project where they're going to be doing free solar installations on 10 businesses um, in the MLK 
a business corridor in Anacostia, but they hired summer youth employment program mm -hmm. students to mm -hmm. learn how to do those installations. And I think that that um, kind of is in the mo a move in the right direction. So mm -hmm. kids are learning about solar. They're learning how to install solar. Mm -hmm. They could potentially get jobs in solar. Mm -hmm. And they're doing free installations on these bi businesses in our community. So I think that that's one example of kind of a move in the right direction by mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to your to your to your for, your the point that you started on around how um, you know a, a lot of the mainstream environmental groups you know haven't like um, uh, you know, that th this isn't 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 how they approach the the issues right um, like I actually I actually think that there's been like a sea change mm -hmm. uh, a sea change in 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 the environmental movement around um, at least recognizing the fact that climate and equity go go hand in hand. Like a lot of people, kind of in the national organizations in particular, like they get it. Like it's been it's been beaten in them, frankly, over the, you know by folks like CJA and uh, and uh, uh, and others over the uh, uh, over a number of years. Um, but one, you know, not everyone has got the memo, right? Uh, so even though the, the the kind of like top leadership might like really like care about this and and be invested in it. Um, you know, folks that are like have been in the movement for a long time. There's a sense of like inertia, right? Where it has been a white dominated, you know, white middle class dominated kind of um, uh, 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 movement for a time. Um, and so there are like, you know, there, there, there. On the one hand, there's tensions. On the other hand, the, the path of least resistance is still, mm -hmm. you know, to just go with the folks who like already understand the issue and already like are 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 invested in it, right? Um, so what? Part of what we see our role uh, uh, as is to kind of expand the circle of people who are invested both on the equity side, um, uh, who, who might already care about climate but aren't really thinking about uh, racial justice, and vice versa, folks that are thinking about racial and economic justice but might not get the environmental mm -hmm. uh, stuff yet, or at least it isn't at the forefront of their minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I saw a hand at the back of the room. Long -term vision of how to use the reality of climate change and massive inequality for like total system transformation. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it's. I think it's. Uh, I think. I think that's that's the goal. That's mm -hmm. the. Uh, uh, we haven't. Fig yeah, we haven't figured out the the roadmap. Like you know, we pointed our compass in the right direction. We uh, uh, we think. Um, um, but that's you know one thing that is like um, uh, just core to like folks that do organizing is that you start with pe with where people are at mm -hmm. right um, um, and you know I, I I think that's kind of where where we are we're trying to get more people um, engaged in this work you know to, to to begin with so that we can actually start thinking about okay well over the long term how do we really want our energy system to work how do we actually want our economic system to work um, you know because you know climate change is a product is 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 is, is, is a product of neoliberalism and capitalism right so like mm -hmm. how do we start to take that on but we don't want to start there mm -hmm. uh, with most of the folks that we're that we're engaging on a day-to-day -day basis um, and then so other one more point that I actually wanted to make earlier is that like you know the notion of like bringing equity into the climate uh, fight isn't just about like justice, right? And isn't just about like, you know, the fact that, um, you know, that, you know, one in six black children has asthma, right? Mm -hmm. Just because that's wrong. It's also because like, there are not enough white liberals to win mm -hmm. on climate justice, yeah. right? We actually need politically to like increase the, uh, uh, to, to, to grow the tent of people that are engaged in this work. And we think that is, you know, we do that by starting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Um, to your question, I think this is this is a really um, critical time in history, and I think that we're in a time where there are multiple crises happening globally um, and nationally and locally. But just seeing some of the conversations that have been happening over the last two years in my neighborhood, um, going to uh, programs organized at the local library where people are talking about police, but talking about police um, 
through the lens of the economy mm -hmm. where people are talking housing, but talking about housing um, through the lens of returning citizens and mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And so I think that people are making the intersections naturally and seeing the intersections naturally. And so I think that it's an opportunity for national groups like People's Action and others to really begin to shape narrative. One of the most exciting projects that I've really been following closely is the Next Systems Project that the Democracy Collaborative is doing. And I think that they're kind of trying to speak to that question that you raised is, you know, how are, what are we building towards? Um, I think for too long we've been talking about climate justice in a vacuum, we've been talking about labor in a vacuum, and now people are starting to talk about this on a systems level. What, we don't want this system. I think that we are pretty much universally agreed that the economy is broken, our political system is broken, so what is the next system that we're going to replace it with? And that's not an answer that any one of us in this room can give, but it's an answer that we have to arrive at collaboratively, mm -hmm. and I'm just excited to see all of the spaces that have been created for people to begin to collaborate around what that will look like. Um, so I don't know, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> Do you plan for Okay. Well, I'm gonna get to say goodbye to Jennifer right now while she quietly scoots that, even though I just drew attention to it. Um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna give y'all another round of applause. Why thank not? You. Um, yeah. <laughs> and thank you. For, thank you for joining us. And I know there are lots of incredible people in the room. So Janet has my contact yeah. information. If any of you would like to build connect folks together. Um, so we might stick around for another 10, 15 minutes if folks are okay and keep having a conversation. Um, are there any other any other questions? We don't have to sit here. You can go outside also if you feel like it. Um, any other questions for who, those of us that are left? <laughs> or for each other? Because actually there are, oh, except then it's just snuck out. Yeah. Um, but just comments, questions to raise in the room, because I know there are actually a bunch of experts here um, who work on climate and work on mm. justice inequality, who work on new economy, who work on just transition. So it's so it's actually directed to the front. Yeah. Um, I'm currently interning with Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I'm working on a project, uh, Climate Change Makes Me Sick. Um, and there are weekly postcards, and we're highlighting health impacts from the different uh, environmental factors that that happen because of climate change. Um, and we're following the climate and health assessment that was just released in April. So we're following that weekly. So what I'm something that um, I've been really trying to do is instill um, the different health impacts based on the different uh, communities, which is something that I, I noticed that, you know, it's, it's important because it's something that I feel like is sometimes a little, it, it may be overlooked. Um, I'm new to this specifically. Um, and so one of the things that I was going to ask is, do you have any um, suggestions as to how I can um, include that into, um, we have a, a postcard, which is one image and a, a headline. And then we have a supporting web page that um, describes the different health impacts. So um, I've been trying to include, you know, different um, agricultural areas or economic factors or um, even being able to visit the, the doctor, things like that. So that's something I've been trying to do, but do you have any suggestions on how to make this easier or how to or have, like, keep things in the back of my mind so I can make sure that I'm really reaching out to the full spectrum because I'm, that's something that I want to do. So do you have any suggestions? So, so your question is about how you reach out to a more diverse set of folks or is a question about like how you include information about disparate health impacts? That, because um, the, if I were talking to someone face to face, it's a little easier. But because I'm trying to put in all this information on one web page and trying to keep their um, attention, I I want that. Do you have any tips on how to put in all this information on one web page and make sure that they continue reading it? And it's already a kind of biased uh, community because it's on a website and you know it's on social media. But I want to try to make sure that it's accessible or uh, yeah. understandable. So there's. There are lots of folks that like track this kind of data, and there's lots of articles mm -hmm. and research out uh, out there on it. But like one suggestion that the next, I, I you know I don't see a lot of this happening is that rather than like kind of leading or just relying on the statistics, like actually like including like a picture and a story of someone who's actually personally 
uh, uh, impacted. And there's you know folks like you know organizations like ours that like have access to lots of people like that mm -hmm. um, who have stories to tell. Mm -hmm. I think just to, to mirror that there, I think groups like National Nations United, the folks who are working with people who are impacted with the health effects of climate change, also are doing that same kind of work of bringing forward the faces and voices of nurses who are working with communities who are, who are feeling the effects. So I think that's, yeah, just to play on that kind of other side of the of the health issue as well might be interesting. Be in touch. Chloe. Um, I'm sorry, this is your presentation. But I'm curious, I know you work a lot on the national level, um, and I'm wondering what engagement you have with the faith community. I'm part of a faith economy ecology working group, and we educate people of faith about food economy issues, including energy democracy. So I'd love to hear some of the stories, the ways you're engaging the faith community in this work at the local level. Yeah. So, uh, at the local level is kind of is, is kind of the thing. On the national level, we haven't really like um, you know targeted uh, faith as like a constituency that we're like you know we're we're uh, our 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 network is kind of um, model ag agnostic. Like there are you know folks that do faith based organizing and folks that do labor organizing, folks that do just like community block club type organizing or like um, electoral. So. Uh, our members are, are our membership organ our member organizations are all over the map. Uh, some of them and some of them do like organize people in congregations and are you know like the you know you know Pope Francis's you know very uh, out you know outspoken uh, 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 visit was was super helpful to those communities. Um, there what what is exciting is there are other networks like the Pico National Network for example um, who are. Uh, who haven't like who like us haven't historically done a lot around climate justice, but are like learning really fast and engaging more of their members uh, uh, in the work. Um, um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, some some of that stuff is happening, and I think more is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You guys should connect because you'll both be at Common Bound uh, oh, and yeah. are organizing around energy yeah. democracy stuff there. I think I saw a hand in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. And I think I think I get that that root of um, it's funny on the international level. One of the famous things that one of our leaders once said, you know, George Bush said, um, "Our way of life, the American way of life, is not up for negotiation." When when saying he wasn't going to be part of the UN climate negotiations anymore. Um, and I think I think that actually speaks a little bit to this idea of, uh, you know, many folks have said, you know, I'm interested in addressing climate change. I'll change a light bulb. I will buy more local food. But um, to really confront the ways that we would have to change um, systemically the way we live our lives in interaction with each other and interaction with the planet um, would be really uncomfortable. I think one of the challenges that I mean, we, the, the mainstream environmental movement was catching a lot of flack for not talking about, you know, why aren't you talking about meat production um, and eating meat when that's, you know, agricultural animal husbandry is like a huge source of carbon dioxide emission. And the environmental community kind of came back and said, gosh, I don't really, you know, it's, it's tough for us to think about alienating this group of people. Uh, and I think that's been one of the challenges. It's the same kind of challenge as, as climate and, and workers and unions. I think environmentalists have been nervous and climate change activists have been nervous about focusing on systemic shifts because it is uncomfortable. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna make people feel like, gosh, what am I gonna lose? Um, and I think that's the idea of um, thinking about climate justice and just transition and looking at the opportunities that shifting away from an economic system that's built on poisonous fossil fuels, not just poisonous for climate, poisonous for people living in those areas, and an economic system that actually extracts <laughs> finance out of communities and extracts time out of people um, is actually a really incredible positive. So it speaks to the idea of, of I think that the, a, a woman had asked earlier, um, in a way this crisis is, I think Naomi Klein said it, you know, it's exciting, it's a gift because we have to do this work way. It just puts a really short timeline on it. So it's, it's a systemic um, social change work that needed to happen, um, but just kind of amps it up. Um, I I see in the back. <laughs> Please. Uh, we've worked with Danny for 20 years on economic human rights, a whole range of issues, and um, so 
uh, but it just took us 20 years to write one of those <laughs> But uh, Janet Redmond runs our climate policy work. Jordan Estevall is with the group. I was just telling Danny actually about the merger of the group and the Creative People's Action and what you guys are doing to build power in the country. And um, so I, I just want to say that Danny and James Early, who's also on our board, uh, are about to go over to the to OIS. Uh, but I just wanted to say um, that this conversation has been on how we do a just transition, you know, to a, to a different energy future that is good for low-income people and people of color. And Danny and James have been spending a lot of time in America with governments that a lot of them rooted in fossil fuels yeah. and who are struggling with these same issues as well. Um, and so I don't know if you've gotten into the international stuff. No, I mean, we have, um, you know, we have until we keep it up for seven minutes. I mean, if you have a couple of words to share, either of you, about kind of the, that transition from Latin America and that international scene and how, I mean, yeah, this can speak to that challenge and what does that mean for people in this country who depend on those revenues for food programs, literacy um, programs, et cetera. This is being recorded, so <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we were. Um, we we began with Naomi Klein at the beginning, and she was writing the book, and we had I thought we were going to um, have the book and the film come out at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's ironic that the first scene of the film is Fort McMurtry in that book. That's right. Which has been on fire, you know, yeah. figuratively. But um, I, one of the things that is certainly, um, and, and and I'm not too much, I'm not well versed on on what what is happening. Is certainly in Latin America. Certainly, one of the excuses, certainly rationales for the maintaining the, the same system in terms in terms of. Extraction is because of development. There's yeah, usually yeah. the argument about that, around that, you know, and so they're going to have to be some, some, some clear alternatives in which uh, they can sustain their development at the mm -hmm. same time while leaving that oil in mm -hmm. in the ground. I know proposals have been to that they receive some sort of abatement or some mm -hmm. sort of re, um, allowance for leaving the oil in the ground mm -hmm. or other extracted resources in the ground. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's certainly as we, as, I'm just just reading Bill McKibben's article uh, uh, about methane, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. and, and, and the nation just recently, you know, that, and what's happening, that the process is going a lot faster than we had anticipated. Um, um, and, uh, uh, but just the whole idea, because I'm, I'm really referred to, I didn't take one acting class in college because I studied economics. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but one, one, of, one of the certain the things that I'm fascinated about how we now present this, this new economy in relationship yeah. to fuel uh, and, and, uh, and, and certainly renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. but uh, how we look at the ideas around about uh, the relationships around economics mm -hmm. as well. Which is new, you know, because we have been for so long, and I think King was so, so prophetic about this understanding the relationship between consumerism, which began to make its its, its inroads mm -hmm. into the American psyche in, in large in large sense during this um, post World War II, but also the ideas around uh, around the relationship between that race and um, and and militarism as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I'm I'm excited about what we have, as, as Grace Lee Boggs it often mm -hmm. calls called in the next revolution, American Revolution, mm -hmm. is going to be about about sustainable activism. Mm -hmm. You know, and the idea around sustainable activism on all these issues uh, mm -hmm. that. That affect our lives right now at this moment, but certainly affect the planet and our children's and grandchildren's life are are certainly um, 
one, one of the reasons why I wanted to be on the, join the board mm -hmm. of IPS was mm -hmm. because of that. Because I think that IPS finds, it, finds itself at this at, at a, a very center of all these discussions. At the same time, making the connections from various, various groups, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's an important part of it. Making is, is my friend James Hope network to network, mm -hmm. and that's going to be critical as we move to this next stage, post post this election, mm -hmm. and and all of us who have been <clears throat> engaged in something, some sort of activism on various levels, you know, for most of our lives, are excited certainly about this, mm -hmm. and certainly we know it, that. I see so many young faces in this audience, mm -hmm. as, long as, as well as those faces who, mm -hmm. of those who've been been on that, you know, at, right at the apex of mm -hmm. this uh, uh, struggle. But I, I'm so excited about that as well mm -hmm. to be able to <clears throat> be able to see these new voices nurtured, and and certainly uh, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. We don't know, and that's probably the best thing for us. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a movie or a television episodic television show where there's some prescribed outcome there's everything. This is life as it is. And to be able to engage that and engage our own process mm -hmm. and our own victories and setbacks mm -hmm. within that framework is something that's exciting as well. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? As someone who I mean who has had a lifetime of activism and has uh, in particular has been looking at different struggles around the world and different movements around the world, where are you seeing, just with that kind of forward-looking vision, where, what are you seeing that's most hopeful or what's most exciting about, um, yeah, deep transformation uh, in, in the kind of movements you're seeing, in the international movements here domestically? What, 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 the, what excites you about that launch well, forward? Well, at first, we spent over the last decade, more than a decade, around Latin America. James, for, for the last 40, 40 years mm -hmm. around Latin America, we saw Many things that happen in, in terms of organizing. One, one of the issues that I think we all recognize that <clears throat> that despite this organizing, which was specifically, you know, from the bottom up, mm -hmm. it wasn't top down. I you know, the various leaders may be been, been the the articulators of of what was happening from the, the bottom up. <clears throat> But one of the concerning things is the reaction that capital has, yeah. you know, at that particular point. What response to that, you know? And my my wife is from Brazil, and and <clears throat> she had worked in Lula's first government mm -hmm. in the Department of Education. She's a professor of education, Ministry of Education, and and certainly introduced some of the some of the different ideas around Afro descendants mm -hmm. and their and 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 learning and, and working mm -hmm. there's the history stories etc into the popular or not popular but certainly into the to, to the public discourse as well and so and so one of the things that's happening right now is we see right in our face a coup yeah. we make no doubt about it the coup is happening or or similar forms of it happening in venezuela and similar forms of it happening and undermining in argentina mm -hmm. Uruguay, and 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 the and certainly those leaders have been. So in the one hand, what certainly concerns me is that they've gone through a mm. politicalization. Now we can't, I'm not, these apples and oranges, but we mm. historical. But they have their own historic arc as well. They've gone through this political uh, process, how capital has destabilized the, those economies in a sense, whether it's the reduction in oil or the lowering in oil prices, or the, uh, and it says, et cetera, in order to 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 destabilize us. That concerns me. What is the reaction to that? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to learn a lot about perhaps what we may feel and may happen as we begin to build this movement mm -hmm. by the reaction to the reaction that people take in these countries like Brazil and Latin America. So I think there's a great deal we can learn from that in, in Venezuela, how people continue to build and sustain their movements, you know. The fact that 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 the movement may be symbolizes a personality it's a sense. Mm -hmm. We have to understand it's, mm -hmm. in our case too that the movement is not about personality. Mm -hmm. It's about simply critically, you know, of what the message is. Mm -hmm.
you know, and build it around that. So I think what, one of my concerns is about how do they respond to this particular point in time, you know. And I, I see it every day because my, my, my wife is here mm -hmm. and she's monitoring every moment what's happening, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And there are days that are up and there are days that are not, uh, that, that certainly that she feels uh, afraid uh, about what's happening there in our country. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think one of the lessons we could learn from, from there, and, and I think we'll, I'm, I'm not saying they're aptly on you, but certainly we, as we begin to, to find our way through this extraordinary moment, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been on the road with, with Bernie uh, and s several uh, Kendrick Sampson, the young actors, a reoccurring role on, on how to get away with murder. He's, he stepped out from the group of the rest of the actors in the cast and in the shows that are produced by the company and said, hey, I'm sure it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, supporting Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And he's been on the road with him, California, Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, New York, uh, Massachusetts, everywhere with him in terms of that. So essentially, it's, 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 it's exciting, some of the same things that, 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 that IPS has been been right in the middle of uh, all these years since its existence and maintaining the, the discourse of building another narrative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, please, James. What is some of the mature sense of transformation and realistic sense of like we are, we are all in this room so much uh, socialized around notions of resistance, mm -hmm. um, and we must resist, but our goal is to transform, mm -hmm. and transform is not arriving at utopia tomorrow. Yeah. So what does a mature situation look like? Two things. Although neoliberalism is being revived in Latin America today, we have to go back and reflect on when there was a boom in uh, mineral uh, income from, from, from oil in particular and other extractive how mature were we in challenging those leaderships on the one hand to be yeah. practical minded? You yeah. just can't cut yourself off one day. And on the other hand, putting some significant amount of that surplus into not just exploring, but actually creating alternatives. I think that's an outstanding yeah. question. That question redounds to us now with the political revolution, you know, notions of the Arab Spring and all of that, citizens disenchanted with the status quo of political parties and so forth, is now going on in this country. So now that uh, the political revolution uh, has the platform, you know, it seems like we're just talking about it, it seems like the conciliation has turned the platform of the Democratic Party over to the progressives, because they don't really have to live by the platform afterwards. But some of those things are going to get through. How do we hold the progressives in Congress really responsible? And it's going to be through an active citizenship uh, without romanticizing the faults in Latin America. And there are many things we can talk about, which we can't talk about right now. And all of my favorite countries and all of my favorite leaders, there is much criticism to be raised. But we're going to have to put some wholesome and productive pressure on the Progressive Caucus. We can't sit back and gaze at them and wait for them to do. We're going to have to find efficient ways to be active 24-7 and live realistic lives and go to the movies and make love and all those other different things. Uh, not the kind of dogmatic history that some of people like myself may have when we thought, you know, all you had to do was meet all the time and work all the time and not worry about <laughs> and insurance and vacation. So I think these are some of the lessons that uh, we can begin to extract about a participatory democracy. What does that mean for transformation? And I think IPS. Of the many organizations, I'm on this board, uh, the many organizations that we're aware of, we're affiliated with, IPS, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's how to turn uh, great ideas into practical solutions, uh, IPS is really embedded uh, in collaboration with a lot of on-the-ground organizations. The final thing is race. Uh, I don't have to talk to you about race because you can see the clumsiness with which not Bernie Sanders, it's not him alone. Mm -hmm. The campaign has handled the intersection economic class issues and race issues. Uh, we all have to get better. We have to look around this room and every room we're in and not go trip ourselves and ask, why aren't 
they, whoever the they is here, why those perspectives in here, what do we do uh, in a very mature, transformative way to take those on? And we have to connect that, particularly to the rest of this hemisphere. Brazil is over 50% Afro Brazilian, with one of the steepest class divides. Mm -hmm. Some would argue the steepest class divide in the world. They are just discovering uh, now that they've got all these white men. The first question was women. But women were not the issue in the capitalization of capitalism in this hemisphere. It was a part of it, but it was not the principal part of it. We have been blind to the issue of race. Uh, we, will, we have not been as open eyed to the issue of race as we might have. We haven't been totally blind. So, as you take up your work in looking at the intersection, particularly across this hemisphere, uh, we have to really think about Afro descendants. Um, I think we should. Leave it there and let you get back and let us run off. Uh, yeah, no, and that's, yeah. Anyway, at this point, so I thank, thank you both you for, for being here. Uh, and, thank you. Yeah, and thank you All for right. that chat. Right. Right. Thank thank right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay.